Hi everyone, I am Krista Cowan. I'm the corporate genealogist here at Ancestry and hello to our friends on Facebook uh, that are joining us not at Roots Tech. <laughs> um, this is kind of a fun topic for me. I get to talk about what's new at Ancestry, but I get to do it here with, you know, 20 of my closest friends and a few thousand of my closest friends on Facebook instead of on the big stage, right? So that means that we can be a little bit more casual. Um, I don't have a big formal PowerPoint deck. I don't have, I just want to make sure that I show you some of my favorite new things. And then if you have some questions, I'll repeat those so that uh, we know what the questions are and we'll go through those. We've got 25-ish minutes together. So let's dive right in, okay? How many of you um, know about the card catalog on Ancestry? Oh, see, I'm teaching you well. Okay, it's my favorite thing on our whole website. Besides just being a really, really great resource, it is also the place you can go at any time to see what is new in content or records on Ancestry. So some of you are looking at me with confused faces, so let me just show you where you find it. Click on search, and under the search menu, down here almost to the bottom, you're gonna see the card catalog, okay? And if you go into the card catalog, the default sort to the card catalog is by date added, which means the newest stuff is automatically going to be at the top of the list. We put this little new tag on every database, and we leave it there for 90 days. So if it says new, it is new within the last 90 days. So a couple of the things that you're going to see that are kind of a big deal. Uh, some announcements they made this morning from the keynote. If you were listening to Margot, our CEO, and Todd Godfrey, our Vice President of Content, uh, they announced that we now have six million um, birth certificates from New York City, seven million death certificates from New York City, and almost a million marriage licenses from New York City. So those went online this morning. Okay, We also have a, a large series of French birth marriage and death registers that just went online. And then the big announcement this morning was about, I think the number is 38 million World War II draft cards. So we've been scanning and digitizing these records at the National Archives in St. Louis for about six and a half years. And we've been doing that in partnership with Family Search. And we've been placing the states online as we've finished them over the course of the last several years. But we finally finished them all. And they are all now all available on Ancestry. So they we're on Fold 3, so you used to be able to search the index on Ancestry, and then you'd have to have a Fold 3 subscription to access the images. All of those images are now available on Ancestry. So if you have that Ancestry subscription, you'll be able to access that. So those are the big content announcements. Those are the new records that have been placed online recently with Ancestry. And as I mentioned again, you can come in here at any time and just see what's new. Now let me give you a little tip for the card catalog since we're sitting here. The easiest way to search the card catalog is to use the title field and to search by state or by country, okay? So for example, if I'm interested in Virginia, I can just come in here and I can type in Virginia and hit enter, and you'll notice it kind of adjusts. The new stuff is still at the top, so I've got this new collection of African-American funeral programs from 1935 to 2009. That sounds fascinating. Sometimes I just look at content and if it has nothing to do with my family history, I still go look at it because I'm a genealogy nerd. Okay, so, so we have these, the new stuff at the top. You'll also start to see this, right? This little updated tag. And here's what that means. That means that sometime within the last 90 days, something about that database was changed. Usually what it means is that we've added new records. So for example, let's see here. Uh, the Virginia birth records, it looks like they now go through 2015. So every state in the United States and every country in the world has different laws regarding privacy and access to records. So for example, here in the state of Utah, we have a 100-year privacy law on birth records. So no birth records are publicly available uh, after 1920. If you want a birth record from after 1920, you have to be that person or be closely related to that person, and you have to go to the county to get the record or to the state. Okay, But prior to 1920, they're public, which means they can be put online and all sorts of things, right? 
Some states, like the state of Texas, Texas is what we call an open record state, which means all of their birth, marriage, and death records are public record, and most of them are online. So if you were born in Texas or California or North Carolina, your birth record's probably online somewhere, okay? So every state controls that privacy law regarding their records. Some states, that means have Apparently, Virginia has some law that said we couldn't have the birth records up through a certain period of time. It looks like it might be like a five-year window there. So about every five years or so, Ancestry will go and back to the state and see if we can get the next set of records that have become publicly available. And we'll just add it to the existing databases. And so what will happen is you'll start to see these updated tags showing up on existing databases because we're adding the next set of years for that particular set of records. Did that make sense? Sometimes I explain things and I don't know if you're looking at me like raptly or you don't get it. Okay, so there we go. When I, when I talk to you all through YouTube, I just talk to my webcam, so I have no idea what you look like. Uh, so interactive is a little more fun. So that's how I use the card catalog. That's what those two tags mean, new and updated. Are there any questions here about that? Going once, going twice. Okay, let's move on. So that's the new records on Ancestry. Now, Ancestry has also been doing a lot of new work on the other features of the site. So one of the features on our site, of course, is our trees. Family trees on Ancestry are free. Anybody can have a tree. All you have to do is have a guest account. You don't have to have a paid subscription. You can build your tree on Ancestry. What that also means is that you can share your tree with anybody on Ancestry. They do not have to have a subscription. They just have to have a login, okay? Uh, what your subscription pays for is access to the records that are behind the paywall. Okay, so that's the, that's the difference there. So in our family tree service, uh, one of the things that starts to happen is you get these little leaf hints. I like spring, so my tree has all the leaves. Some of you act like it's fall and you have a leaf blower and you want to clear all the leaves all the time and you get a little obsessive about it. I just like spring. Okay, so I have leaves all over my tree and in the last year we made some really major changes to how we deliver those leaf hints. So some of the changes that we made this year are a little bit under the covers, which means they might not be so obvious to some of you. So we're gonna look at the leaf hint changes that we made. One of the changes that we made is that leaf hints are now delivered almost exclusively based off of the work that, uh, that you're doing in your trees. So for example, if I find a 1940 census for my grandfather and I attach it to my tree, and then I also attach his California birth record and his California marriage record and the 1930 census and his World War II enlistment record, and I've got this nice little profile of records that I've built up attached to my grandfather. Now, one of you comes along and you search for my grandfather and you find the 1940 census and you attach it to your tree. Guess what you're gonna get as hints? His California birth record and his California marriage record and that World War II enlistment record. All those other records I've attached to that same person you're gonna show, they're gonna show up to you as hints, okay? So that's how we're leveraging this really amazing community and the work that people are doing. What that means is, is that some of you who've developed some not so great habits of just attaching everything because you're not sure and you don't wanna lose it, stop it, <laughs> okay? Um, if you see a hint and you're not sure if it's your person or not, mark it maybe, don't mark it yes. Okay, let me show you where you're gonna do that. Let's pick one of my ancestors here. Let's go to Albert, I use Albert a lot. Let's see if I've used him too much. Nope, he still has 20 hints. Okay, so here is my great grandfather. And these are the hints that I have here for my great grandfather on this page, okay? And so you're gonna see we've got some photos, we've got some stories, we've got a clipping of his obituary. If I scroll down here further, there's some pictures. I'm gonna get to some records eventually. There we go, there's his 1930 census record. That looks like it's his social security death record. There's his World War II draft card that just came online this morning and I haven't seen it yet, I'm super excited. Okay. I'm not gonna get distracted, I promise. So here we have these records, okay? And this is one of the changes that we recently made um, to the hint page. Right over here on the right-hand side, do you see where it says different, 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 new? Okay, or up here it says different, match, match. Or down here it says same, different, new, okay? What we've done is for every field of information in the record, we're gonna tell you if that information is the same as what's in your tree, 
if it's different than what's in your tree or if that's a new piece of information that you don't have. So it helps increase your ability to look at that hint and decide, is this really my person or not, okay? Um, the other thing that we've done is we've given you this little toggle right here. It's called a quick compare. And again, this is new. Let me go back to that 1880 record, or 1930, there we go. And I turn it on, and it's actually gonna show me a little clip of what's in my tree. So not just that it's the diff different or the same, but it's actually gonna say, you have this in your tree, and that's what's in the record. And you have this in your tree, and that's what's in the record. And so it's another way for you to analyze that information to make sure if it's accurate before you save it, okay? Because after you save it, it's a lot harder to unsave it and all the information. So, um, Here's the challenge, right? M records are messy. <laughs> I don't even know another way to say that, right? I don't know about you, but I rarely find all records for a person where every piece of information is the same. Their name's spelled the same, their birth date's the same. The, like, records are all over the place. And so you need to put on your analytical brain. And sometimes you need to look at two or three records to see, right? Does this information match? Is this him? Is this him? Sometimes you have to scroll through three or four records, okay, before you can decide, yes, these three records are him and this one record is not. So don't be so quick to just yes, yes, no, no, yes, yes, no, no on your hints. Sometimes look at several of them together and this quick compare allows you to do that. What that means is that the best practice for reviewing your hints is from the person page in your tree. Because while you're here, it gives you all the context of the family and the facts and all the hints for that person together in order to make the best decisions about whether this record is for your person or not. Using the all hints list is fine if all you're doing is clicking through and ignoring things that you don't want in your tree. But using the all hints list isn't always the best practice when you're trying to analyze records in context. Does that make sense? Are there any questions? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I'll repeat the question um, in a minute because I'm going to answer that next, okay? Okay, so her, she's saying she gets hints from her own tree, but they're things that other people have copied and then re-uploaded. The challenge is when somebody copies something out of your tree, to their computer and then re-uploads it to Ancestry, we have no way of knowing that that's the same picture or the same document. So stop doing that, y'all. Just use the save button. And if you save it, instead of downloading it and then re-uploading it, if you just save it, we know it's the same picture. And then you're not gonna get hints of your own stuff back to you, okay? Okay, let's talk about your question. So her question was, if I click ignore, what happens? Or if I click save, what happens? And then how does that information inform Ancestry? So I'm gonna go ahead and just click ignore on this record, even though that's his tombstone, <laughs> just to show you. And don't worry, it's not gonna break anything. Okay, when you click ignore, one of the new features we gave you this year is the ability, if you want, to tell us why you ignored that hint. So we give you some pre-selected options here. The name's wrong, the places are wrong, the relationships are wrong, I already have this information, the dates are wrong, or you can write in your own reasoning, or you can do both, right? So we give you these options to write why you ignored a hint, and we look at that data. And if a bunch of people are ignoring hints because the names are wrong, maybe we need to look at our algorithm and see what's causing those hints to be delivered incorrectly, okay? So yes, that information does inform us. That information also informs you. So I could, for example, write, I just don't wanna deal with this record right now, right? Don't wanna deal with it. Maybe I'm not ready to deal with the fact that he's dead. And, oh, that scared me, okay don't want to deal with it. And then um, I stop typing and you'll see this little saved, just it auto saves, okay? And now I can move on to my other hints if I want. Well, that record went right up here into this ignored tab. That's where it went. And so I can click on ignored and I can find that hint at any time and I can see my reason why I ignored it. Because here's what happens. Sometimes you ignore a record because you think, oh, that's not my person. And then you do more research and you're like, okay, maybe that was my person. 
And so the hint is not gone forever. You can come back to it. You can look at your reasoning and maybe you can make a different choice now if you want. Okay, so I like leaving myself notes. Here's what this has done for me. It's kind of taken um, my research log and just made it really personal. So professional genealogists, we tend to keep really detailed research logs as we do research and we write down everything we search and what we find and what we don't find. And sometimes that gets super tedious, right? What this allows me to do is just keep this little research log at each record attached to the person in this particular hint tab, okay? Same thing with undecided. If I say maybe on a hint, maybe this is my person, but I'm not sure, we give you a set of reasons to answer that. So it allows you to save the hint without attaching it to your tree if you don't know for sure if it's the person or not, okay? And then when you save a record, same thing. You can say, here's why I decided this really is my person, and you, and you can answer those questions, and again, it starts to form a little bit of a research log. So that's one of the new things we've done on hints. That feedback does come back to Ancestry so that we can continually improve our hint algorithms to deliver you more relevant hints so that you can find what you're looking for, uh, but also it serves a purpose for you as well. Okay, any questions about the new hint stuff? Going once, going twice. Okay, well, I'll tell you one last thing about hints, and then we'll move on to something else. So hint, the other thing that we did kind of under the covers at Ancestry this last year, based on feedback from you, was we created this thing called hint relevancy or hint, uh, hint uh, inventory management. I think that was the official internal name for it. Basically, what used to happen is you would put something in a tree, and we would go out and search our hint databases and we would deliver hints. And those hints would just be cached to your tree and they would just sit there. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I'll enter information in my tree. Like I'll find the mother's name on a death certificate. And so I'll add a mother and I'll list her name as Mary Smith. And I don't know anything else about her yet because I'm researching her son, but I just found her name on his death certificate and I wanna save it. So I put her in as Mary Smith. Well, Ancestry gets all excited and we go out and we look for hints for Mary Smith all the Mary Smiths, and we deliver you all the hints for Mary Smith. And then you find out, oh, well, his mother, Mary Smith, she was born in Virginia. So then you go add her birthplace as Virginia, because it says that on one of her other son's death certificates. And then you find the family in the 1850 census, and you realize how old she is, and so then you put in an approximate birth year for her. And now you know she was born in, you know, about 1831 in Virginia. And now you're ready to start researching Mary Smith. And so you go to your hints and you've got Mary Smith born in England in 1582 and Mary Smith born in Ohio in 1920 and met, right? Because when we ran, when you first put her in your tree, we said, oh look, here's some Mary Smith hints. And then they just sat there. So that's what we were doing before. So this year, the change that we made is Every time you add a new piece of information to a person or a new relationship to a person, we refresh those hints and refresh those hints. So what's going to happen is sometimes you're going to see a hint there one day and it'll be gone the next day because we don't think that hint is relevant anymore. Okay, some of you that gives you anxiety. I saw it just now on your face. Don't take away my hints. That we don't think they're relevant, <laughs> okay? If it is, you'll find it again. It will come back, okay? Sometimes that also means in the process of refreshing your hints, sometimes it just means things get ordered, reordered. So that it might still be on the list of hints for that person, just in a different place on the list, okay? So that's the hints inventory management. That's a total behind the scenes thing that's happening. So it's not something like new shiny thing that we gave you, but it's a super relevant, super important thing that we gave you that you didn't even know we did for you until I just now told you. And how happy are you about that? Okay, any questions about that? Yeah. Uh huh. Yep. So her question is, when everybody else's tree is wrong and yours is right, <laughs> do you ever notice how that's the case? Everybody else's tree is wrong, but mine's right. If that is true, then your tree is wrong too, right? Because I think every, no, <laughs> okay, no, sorry, I'm making fun of you. 
Yes, there are a lot of very simple mistakes that happen just because people are learning. There are sometimes mistakes that have been perpetuated because of a research error decades ago that have made it into all these trees. What I'm going to tell you is instead of trying to play whack-a-mole with information in other people's trees, publish good research. Put the right parents into a public tree and list the sources and include maybe a story or a comment on that person that explains why you think these really are the parents. The best antidote for bad research is good research pu published widely, right? It's not trying to fix everybody else's tree, okay? Okay, let me share with you, I've got four minutes. Let me share with you one last new thing. How many of you here in person have taken an ancestry DNA test? Okay, so what I'm gonna show you is not available yet. Don't tell anybody, all of you watching on Facebook. Okay, so, <laughs> no, we're gonna start testing this later this week and they gave me permission to share it with you. So when you have taken an Ancestry DNA test, you of course get your list of DNA matches. Now I'm gonna show you my live match list and even though we're filming this and putting it online, all the top people here are my immediate family and they've given me permission to share all the things all the time. Okay, so I've taken a DNA test and there's a new little icon that is gonna to start to show up, okay? And this new little icon does this. It allows me to say when I click it, this person on my match list is the same as this person already in my tree. Right? And so it just, it just serves as a pointer so that I can click on this. So let's click on my brother here. Actually, let's click on this brother. I like him better anyway. Shh. Okay. So I'm going to click, oh, Max. Okay. I'm going to click on this brother. Somehow I'm clicking something wrong, but we'll get there. Okay. And now this little icon shows up right here. And when I click it, it pops out a little side panel. And because I've linked it, I can now say view and tree. And when I click that, it takes me to that person in my tree. Oh wait, it goes both ways. You ready for this? Let's see if I can get this to work. Here's that little icon in my tree. I click it. It says, hey, this one, this person's connected to a DNA match. And then when I click that, it says, oh look, here's that person in your match list. Life changing. Let me tell you what happened. They said, hey, we're gonna announce this next week at Roots Tech. Uh, it's not out yet, but we wanna give you early access. They did that to me Friday at four o'clock. We know you have a lot to do this weekend to get ready for Roots Tech, but here's this new toy to play with. Guess what I did all day Saturday? <laughs> I went through my match list connecting people because I'm one of those people, and you might be as well, every time I find a match and I figure out how they're related to me, now I just showed you my brother, that's easy, right? But when you start getting into second cousins and third cousins and fourth cousins, those people that are connecting you to third and fourth and fifth great grandparents and providing that evidence that you need, I add those people to my tree, right? And so I wanna just be able to quickly say, oh, this person on my match list that's using the you know, username Ugly Brother 421 is this person in my tree who is this descendant of my third great grandfather. And I wanna be able to see that evidence start to line up that I'm genetically connected indeed to this third great grandfather through all of these matches, okay? So uh, we're gonna be doing a class specifically on the DNA matching tools here in the booth later. So make sure you pick up a booth schedule. Um, I'll take one last, quote, maybe two last questions. How are you seeing that they're a DNA match if you're... Oh, we send you an email? Yeah. So one of the new things that we did, and I didn't have time to get into it, but one of the new things we did this year on your DNA match list is we gave you the ability to search your match list by username. So if you get the username, you can just search for them that way. Or you can also filter just to a section of your match list based on the amount of shared DNA. So if you know this is a third cousin, you can say, show me everybody that's listed as a third cousin, and it will just filter your list right down to that, okay? Oh yeah, there's loads of... Hey, some of us work at it. Okay, last question. S 
So her question is about, for those of us who use Family Tree Maker or Roots Magic as our desktop software program, those two programs are the only two software programs that sync with your online tree at Ancestry. So I do a lot of my data entry in Family Tree Maker. I sync it with my online tree at Ancestry. I attach the records. I sync it back with Family Tree Maker. So that's how that works. Every time we make a change to the tree service, we notify them. Um, and then they have to decide if they want to make that a feature that also syncs or not. So as far as I know, the brand brand new stuff, of course, hasn't been implemented yet. But uh, if you talk to them, they might be able to give you some insight into how that works. OK, well, that's all we have time for today. Thank you all here. Thank you all on Facebook. Bye, everybody.